Welcome to Senate Education. Uh, uh, this is Tuesday, January 24th, 1.29 uh, p.m. We're going to start our day by spending some time really jumping into the governor's proposal for school safety. Uh, after that, we're going to hear from the State Board of Education and the Secretary of State, Sarah Copeland Hanses, will be in to talk about civic education. And then we'll wrap things up with Act 72 and overview. And that's the school facilities bill that we passed a couple of years ago. Uh, we'll be back into school construction. These are just some highlights tomorrow with the um, uh, with our federal delegation, maybe more than one, hopefully. We've got one here now, and I think Katie's still waiting to hear from others. Uh, and the state treasurer's office will be in. And then on Thursday, we're spending a chunk of time on career technical education. Friday, Sharon Academy, not Sharon Academy, St. John's Ferry Academy and teacher evaluations. Those are a little bit of the highlights. Uh, Ms. St. James, thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. You have the administration's language, I believe, for a proposal. And I ask you, uh, I believe, to draft it into the possible either Brian Campion bill, committee bill, however we might uh, use it. And I don't know if Hayden has a copy of it in front of us or yep. not. Great. Okay, so it's in our testimony. So with that, we're looking at draft 1.1, introduced by the Committee on Education, if we so choose to do so. And the subject is education, school safety. Again, this is the administration's proposal. And uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, as Chair Campion mentioned, this is language that the administration is proposing. I've put it into our drafting format. I formatted it as a committee bill, but again, as Chair Campion said, we can reformat that depending on the committee's pleasure. Um, this is the agency's language. I have not provided really any edits or anything with the exception of um, some technical things and I'll point them out. Um, but this is this is language from the agency just put into our drafting form. So um, it begins with amending section and what we're doing now, so this is your first walkthrough. Is it your first walkthrough? Our first walkthrough. Okay. We, we've gotten high level, hey, here's okay. some language, but this is, we, I'd like a walkthrough. Sure. So um, when we do the walkthrough, it's really the committee's um, pleasure on how detailed and granular I get. This is an easy one to walk through. I'm just giving you kind of a broad overview. Um, but so I'm just going to start by orienting you to where this language um, li will live or uh, is proposed to live. So you can see section one there. You've got 16 BSA section 1481 is amended to read. So we know we're in title 16, right? Your education green book that I'm always going to come here with. Um, and then section 1481, that section lives in chapter 33 of title 16, which is the fire and emergency preparedness drills and safety patrols chapter. It is a very thin chapter. There are only three sections right now. This bill proposes to amend one of them and then add three additional sections to that chapter. So the first proposal is to amend section 1481, which is currently in your green book. Any language that you see that's crossed out is current law, and the proposal is to strike it, to get rid of it, to delete it, to change it somehow. And any language you see that is underlined is new language. That's the proposal that's being added. And any language you see that is neither underlined nor struck is just the law. And there's no, the, the draft you have in front of you wouldn't propose any changes to that language. So you can see we're starting with subdivision, or I'm sorry, subsection A on page one, line 14. The recommendation here is to strike the language in um, the current language in section A, uh, subsection A and replace it with starting on line 18, a requirement that each supervisory union or supervisory district that operates school shall adopt a policy mandating each school site to conduct an options-based response drill each year in the fall and spring of the academic year, we're on page two. The policy shall require that drills be conducted following the template developed by the Vermont School Safety Center. 
jointly with the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team, and a superintendent shall report completion of the biannual drills to AOE in a format approved by the secretary. Senator Hashim. Uh, can you uh, provide a definition for what, op <clears throat> for what options based uh, responses. That is a great question. I cannot provide that okay. definition. Or is that for a future witness? I encourage you okay. to ask a future witness Thank about you. that. It is not currently defined in Title uh, 16, okay. and it uh, was not included in the language provided by you. Senator Blue. I'm wondering if I should ask this or not. Which, um, are the, does this change um, is it also for our academy? That's subsection B. Okay. So on page two, starting on line six, we're going to strike out everything that's in current law in subsection B and replace it with underlying language starting on line 11. And that uh, is basically the same requirement for approved and recognized independent schools. <clears throat> And then you'll see at the very bottom of page two, starting on line 18, subsection C, that language need, is neither struck nor underlined, so that's current law, and the proposal is to keep that. Just a curiosity, going back up to, to line 12, is there a different uh, vehicle that covers universities, you know, different uh, you know, state, state run universities? Is, is there a reason why universities and colleges are exempt? I believe because this language is meant to apply to uh, K through 12 or pre-K sure. through 12. So the intent of ex in excluding universities or colleges, um, this section is really meant for um, the, the chapter itself is really addressed as K through 12, but intent behind that language, you'd have to ask okay. uh, AOE. Okay. So I'm just pointing out that subsection C is current law and there's no proposed amendments there uh, for this draft. And so we're gonna move to page three. There's, uh, we have, we're adding a brand new subdivision here and it's a requirement that uh, every year the Vermont School Safety Center and the Agency of Education review the report submitted um, according to those subsections A and B for public schools and um, independent schools and ensure compliance and identify future planning and training needs. So that's the um, amendments to this chapter. Everything else is, that's proposed is brand new. That, there was a lot of brand new language in there, but it was amending a current statute. So we're gonna add um, section two is adding section 1480 to title 16 uh, entitled emergency operations plans. We're on page three, line five. And it's a requirement that each supervisory union or supervisory district adopt an all hazards emergency operation plan that is at least as comprehensive as the template maintained by the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. And the plan shall be updated on an annual basis, including collaboration with local emergency first responders and emergency management officials. And then subsec subsection B is a requirement that the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team maintains that template. Uh, quick question. The Vermont School Crisis Planning Team, is that something that's already in existence or would this bill, if enacted, create that team? I think you have, um, no, it's already something that's in existence and I think you have a witness coming from the um, School Safety Center who would be able to speak more about yeah. what that is. Thank you. But no, this bill does not create. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Is that accurate, Chair? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, section three, we're adding another section to uh, this chapter in Title 16, we're adding section 1484. And so the philosophy here is we're adding section numbers, um, you know, just kind of rolling with the numbers, one, two, three, fitting them in where um, it made sense to fit them in. Um, uh, so on line 15, page three, subsection A, a requirement that each supervisory union or supervisory district shall adopt a policy that at a minimum requires all school sites and supervisory union um, and supervisory district offices, so the central offices, lock their exterior doors during the school day. The policy shall require that all visitors sign in at a centralized location prior to gaining full access to the school or office site. And then subsection B is the same requirement for approved independent schools.
We're on page four, line one, the last section um, that this bill proposes to add to Title 16 is section 1485 entitled Behavioral Threat Assessment Teams. Each supervisory union or supervisory district and each approved independent school shall appoint a behavioral threat assessment team to be comprised of, at a minimum, administrators, mental health professionals, a school counselor, a school nurse, nurse, and local law enforcement officials. Members of the team shall be trained at least annually in best practices uh, of conducting behavioral threat assessments. Superintendents and heads of independent schools shall report uh, data uh, related to behavioral threat assessment results to the agency. And then annually, uh, the supervisory union district or approved in a school has to report the names of the people on that team. Yes, sir. So what if a municipality doesn't have a, a law enforcement organization? Any idea? That this doesn't, okay. uh, it, it's uh, a requirement to uh, collaborate with local law enforcement, but it doesn't define what local law enforcement is. Okay, thanks. I think Dee Barrett can probably help us with some of that when she testifies. And then the last section you will see in every bill, unless it's orphan language that you're just going to stick in someone else's bill, is an effective date section. This bill has several effective dates and they were proposed by AOE. So the first effective date is the effective date section, which uh, shall take effect on July 1, 2023. And then the recommendation here is that sections one and three take effect on August 1st, 2023, and sections two and four take effect on July 1, 2024. Any other questions for Village Council? I know you have a move. It actually got moved, so okay. I'm not quite at the same. So our, just our first walk through the draft bill. We're going to hear from witnesses today, and then we have a number of witnesses coming in later this week, principals, superintendents, etc. And we'll work through it and see if some people proceed. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because we have some, sorry. Yes, please. We have some new faces in the room also while we're waiting for the commissioner. Let's just go around and introduce ourselves. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Lindsay Edges, Agency of Education. I'm a policy communication specialist. You'll see either Ted or myself here pretty much every day. Great to see you. Uh, Jerome Metley, I'm a current graduate social work student at UVM. Um, also, I'm an internet macro consultant. And where's that consulting from? Uh, it's located in Montpelier. It's a consultant for, from, for social services agencies. Great. Okay. Thank you. I'm Sonny Eric, I'm with Vermont Emergency Management, and I am the lead administrator for the School Safety Center and co chair of the School Break Experience Team. Great. Thanks. I'm Dee Barwick, and I'm the director of violence prevention. Great. Thank you all. Okay. Chief Morrison. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I guess we're in now. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you know the bill that we are looking at. Uh, and so we're looking to hear your thoughts in general on school safety and the proposal before us. Okay, well, thank you. And for the record, my name is Jennifer Morrison. I am the Commissioner of Public Safety. Um, for the benefit of the committee, I wanted to just give some very high level remarks and then turn you over to the capable hands of Dee and Sonny who are the subject matter experts on this particular area. Um, and I also wanted to start by thanking you for your hard work. I know it feels like it's just begun, but it's a lot of work and we're all, uh, we're all appreciative of all that you do. Um, when we think about the school safety center, I think sometimes people think that there's a brick and mortar building that exists somewhere in Vermont, but that's just not the case. It is a construct where the uh, Vermont Emergency Management, which is one of the divisions of the D uh, Department of Public Safety, partners with the Agency of Education, as well as the Vermont Intelligence Center to create a resource and a website and staff expertise on Vermont school safety. But I just wanted to sort of lay the foundation that there, there's not an actual office somewhere that people could go to to, to visit. Um, I, I don't wanna get into too much detail that Dee and Sunny are going to give to you. Um, I wanted to quickly just say that Vermont Emergency Management of course is one of our divisions, but so is the Vermont State Police, which is home to the VIC. Um, the Vermont Intelligence Center that I referenced just a moment ago, uh, as well as within our purview, we have the Division of Fire Safety, which has 
only a little intersection to the bill and this work that we're talking about around school safety in that they uh, promulgate rules around fire drills and fire safety and other things that relate to school safety, but are not exactly in this wheelhouse. So there's at least three parts of, of the Department of Public Safety that intersect with this work. Uh, we are all supportive of the direction that this uh, package of proposals is going. Um, we also have the Radio Technology Shop, the, um, the Vermont Crime Information Center, the Vermont Forensic Lab, and the uh, Finance and Administration Division. So those are the other parts of the Department of Public Safety, just to give you the landscape at the beginning of the session of the things that fall under our purview. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Sunny and Dee to introduce the proposals, and I will stay on the line to answer any questions that you might have of me, if that works for you. I'd like to join us at the table. Sunny, please also as well. <clears throat> As to see you in person. Rather than you as well. Thank you, sir. Um, and if you don't mind just introducing yourselves for the record and uh, work Sure. Um, my name is Dee Bardick, and as I mentioned, I'm uh, the Director of Violence Prevention for the state of Vermont. And I'm Sunny Erickson, Vermont Emergency Management and the School Safety Grant Program Manager. Um, so, first, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, have us here today. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the proposals that uh, Ledge Council had, had gone over a few minutes ago. Um, as I mentioned, my position is the Director of Violence Prevention, and I work with the Violence Prevention Task Force. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, I'm uh, retired from the Vermont State Police, where I spent a little over 26 years. And after that, I worked in the area of school safety for Marcos Healy, where I was the project manager for the uh, Vermont School Safety Initiative in 2019 and 2020. And I'm currently completing my doctorate at the University of Vermont in educational leadership and policy development with my focus on school safety. Um, so the Violence Prevention Task Force was developed as part of the governor's 10-point public safety plan. And it's comprised- just, Do you want us to start following along? We have your presentation, I believe. That is okay. Sorry. We'll wait on that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't come with a PowerPoint. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so the Violence Prevention Task Force was developed as part of the governor's um, ten-point public safety plan, and it's comprised of the secretaries of the Agency of Human Services, Digital Services, and the Agency of Education, as well as the commissioners of Mental Health, Children and Families, Public Safety, Corrections, and the Department of Health. Um, we also, the, the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, as well as the Attorney General's Office also are part of the task force. So we work very closely across state government um, and we've developed a larger policy package of safety initiatives. And this school safety is one section of that larger package, which is what we're here to chat with you about today. Um, I believe Secretary French had testified uh, roughly two weeks, a week and a half or so ago. Um, and then Ledge Council has just had an opportunity to run through the, the language of the, um, the school safety portion of our package. Um, you have clearly seen that there's four specific areas um, that we're addressing related to school safety. Um, and I would first ask if there were any questions you had about any of those um, particular four sections before I... I think there was one question that I noted was the question about options-based responses. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I can go into that a little bit, and I think Sunny um, is prepared to go into that um, more broadly. Um, you know, we're really in the, the world of school safety, we're moving away from just a lockdown to a threat or school emergency, and we're moving um, to an options-based approach. And what that does is, you know, the the environment in school safety is changing all the time and not every situation is going to be met uh, where a lockdown is gonna appropriately meet the needs of that given situation. So we're transitioning away from that and um, into an, the options-based methodology, which provides a variety of options to choose from depending on the dynamics that are unfolding in a given situation. Um, and again, Sunny can um, speak more about that, but it again, option space is exactly like it says. Instead of just being given one option, lockdown, yeah. um, you may uh, 
run hide flight is, is an example where um, an option may be to run in a given situation. It may be to hide, it may be to fight. Again, it gives you, it trains in choices and what is the best choice in, to make in a given situation. Tremendous ask, and this might be Sunny, feel free to punt it. Who, who would be making those decisions in the schools at that moment? Um, which option from which to choose? So in the, the classrooms, teachers would be making those decisions. Um, and again, it would depend on where they are in the building and where the threat is in the building. Okay. So it would change. It wouldn't be like the entire school is going to choose the option to run or the option to hide. It really depends on, again, where they they are in the school or in the building and what the situation is at that exact moment in time. Um, I did want to touch on um, the behavioral threat assessment team portion of um, the policy package and just um, go into a little bit of information about that. Um, what um, oftentimes folks aren't familiar with behavioral threat assessments, so I just wanted to describe that a little bit. Um, they're basically an assessment and management um, process as a preventative approach to threats and acts of violence with the primary goal um, being to um, assess and then manage a situation or um, you know, potential situation that might develop. Um, the effort is to enhance the safety of the individual and the well-being of everyone involved, including the school, the individual concern, the situation in the school community at large. Um, again, this is to, this approach is to identify concerning behavior and provide services to an individual, which may include counseling, mental health support, mentoring, other resources that are available, but basically to provide supports rather than the zero tolerance um, approach that has historically been, been used. Um, and it's part of a broader school safety approach with a caring and collaborative school community. So it's, um, you know, again, I just wanted to sort of give you an overview of what that approach is, is all about. And when the team was mentioned, you know, who's gonna comprise these behavioral threat assessment teams, um, <clears throat> probably picked up that it's a, a wide variety of individual school administrators, mental health counselors, nurses, um, uh, school counselors and law enforcement. And the idea is to bring in a multidisciplinary approach to a given situation. And that allows people from different perspectives to bring their expertise to that situation, that condition, and identify what are the next best steps we can take. Um, and, you know, again, I mentioned it could be mental health counseling for an individual, it could be other support services. But again, this is to identify a um, potential threat before it evolves to an actual threat. Yes. And, um, this is always someone who's in the school building. Is that correct? Or is it the school community at large? The, the proposal that we put forward is um, identify school districts and supervisory unions. So what this proposal would be is, um, is that not every single school would have to have its own team. It could be a, it could be a school team, but it could also be a district or supervisory wide team. Um, and again, that's in keeping in um, two things in mind, really. One is that not every school will have the capacity to have a team. So we have said, okay, a school district team may be in some cases um, a, a better option. Um, but in a lot of our communities too, we see that our school district, we have very tight school communities. We're very fortunate in Vermont to have that. And oftentimes the, the districts are very familiar with you know, families and kids and, um, and what's going on in the greater school community. So um, I think you know, in, our, in our very um, specific area in Vermont, we're fortunate to have those close-knit school communities. And that I believe allows us to have these teams be district-wide or supervisory. Senator Hoshima, Senator Lewin. Um, I'm sorry if you mentioned this, but uh, line seven, could you just tell me what the best practices are? I'm just reading that members of the team should be trained at least annually in best practices and just wondering what the best practices are and where they come from. Um, I'll turn it over to Sunny to, to talk more in detail of that. 
So we are, uh, through the School Safety Center, um, we have been offering for the last year and a half or two years behavioral threat assessment awareness level um, introductory training. And that's, uh, we've partnered uh, with a contractor who is a national thought leader. It's, uh, it was formerly known as Sigma uh, Threat Management. Now they've uh, merged with OnTIC Technologies. And the folks that run those programs and are providing that training to educators throughout the state, and those have been virtual due to the pandemic. Um, they have been in, you know, in the Secret Service as the head psychology folks. They've been really immersed in behavioral threat assessment and how beneficial that can be um, for decades. And so we are, you know, partnered with these thought leaders, and they bring to those trainings what they have identified as the best practices and who should be at the, you know, at the table for those behavioral threat assessments. What you should be looking for, what to identify as really concerning behaviors, or what just might be something that's worth mentioning, but doesn't really need to be fully investigated. Mm -hmm. So the folks that we have contracted with that are delivering these trainings um, are the ones who are coming to the table with the best practices. Awesome. Um, and those can be evolving as you know, as school safety as evolution is, is very quick um, and changes, it feels like almost on a weekly basis. And if new uh, practices pop up very, you know, as we move along, they will bring those into, into the trainings as well. Great to know, thank you. Yes. Did you consider bringing uh, emergency management coordinators or directors into this from municipalities? Um, actually, for be the behavioral threat assessment uh, trainings are open to anyone. So we have law enforcement, is school resource officers. Um, it can be, you know, folks from a township or a municipality. Uh, it, it is open to to anyone who is a, a you know interested in investing stakeholder. In the communities, we, we encourage as many people to participate as possible because that's only going to strengthen your community responses. Um, the um, you know again, this is just a you know an overview of, of our proposals, and um, Ledge Council was able to go into the, the specific um, language on those sections. Um, I would actually, I'm, unless anyone has any questions for me, I can turn it over to Sunny and she will the presentation. Great. I see that you folks have printouts, so that's wonderful. We do. It'd be great to probably bring it up also. Okay. Yeah, that way. Yeah. So, so while we're getting so. Yeah. Question for Dean. Yeah. Yes, Just so while, while your, your colleague is getting set up, um, curious on page three, the emergency operations plans. Is the intent like to draft a template that each school then tailors to its own physical facilities and staffing levels and what have you? What, yeah, what's the that, level of effort following the introduction of the plan? So the, the template already exists. It's okay. been developed and it is available on the Vermont School Safety website. And um, it is being utilized by some schools, um, but this would encourage all schools to be on the same template, the same format for their emergency okay. operations plan. Is there is there then a follow-up kind of validation that they're doing it or they're, uh, they've tailored it appropriately? Is there a subject matter expert that says, hey, Got it. Or, that would be through the Vermont School Safety Center. Okay, All right, very good. Thank you. Is there a um, a button in which I can move that along, or should I just? If ask doesn't time, yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Uh, I'm Sunny Erickson um, with Vermont Emergency Management, and um. In charge and overseeing a number of school safety initiatives and programs uh, through the School Safety Center. And as I mentioned earlier, I work um, very closely as the co-chair with the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. And I thought that what we could do is go over some of the current safety programs that are ongoing right now. And then if there's any questions on you know, previous work that's led up to where we are now or future plans, we can uh, chat about that afterwards. And Cindy, while you're doing that, if you don't mind telling us which ones are kind of required, which ones are optional, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. What, what do you mean by optional? I'm well, sorry. we do, I mean, this is, we would be, as I understand it from Secretary French, we're taking some different programs that are happening throughout the state right mm -hmm. now and making them required. So it sounds like there's some opt-in, some, you know, 
options there right now in some of our schools. Okay. But correct me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're. I mean, you're you're not incorrect. Um, okay. That assumption because as the draft language, um, you know, proposes, there are requirements for behavioral threat assessment, including having to take some of the trainings and reporting back on. Um, you know who's on the team and that they are confirming their um, training requirements have been met and things like that. So those would be overseen by AOE, but they are proposed to be requirements for each of the schools. Okay. Um, the training programs that we offer are open to any educators uh, within the state, um, K through 12, uh, grade grade wise, um, and any of the trainings are um, free of charge, but are not specific requirements, I guess is the best way to describe them. Eventually, behavioral threat assessment may be a, a requirement to be, um, to have the training to be on a team, but the other trainings that we have are not things that are required as far as I know by individual school districts or supervisory unions. Um, and all of these things fall under the purview of the school safety center. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit first because I'm not sure that um, how familiar any of you are uh, with it. And if, uh, if you are familiar with some of the stuff, we can skip, uh, uh, skip ahead. Can we move to the next slide up okay. here? Thank you. So the school safety center, as Commissioner Morrison had uh, noted, when you think of that, you think of a building you can go to with people um, you know, bustling around doing school safety work. In some states, that is the case, but in Vermont, um, as the commissioner noted, it is a resource center, an information clearinghouse, a place where you can go for templates. You can get online training information there. There's tabletop exercises that um, you know, the, the planning teams in the schools can download and run through on their you know, weekly or monthly meetings with their teams. Um, there's a lot of really wonderful information that's housed there. And the School Safety Center has been around since 2016. It's a partnership between AOE and DPS. Um, it's manned uh, by myself and my uh, colleague Rob Evans from the uh, Agency of Education, and he's the School Safety Liaison Officer. And we co-chair um, the school crisis planning team, which helps put out these gu the guidance and the templates and the recommendations through the safety center. So our goal in the safety center is to uh, promote uh, preparedness measures, uh, get folks as much training as they can, work on emergency operations plans, all hazard approaches to planning. Um, we work with, uh, you know, counselors and teachers and principals and superintendents, um, really the whole spectrum of folks that are immersed in the education world. And we provide the best practices and recommendations, and those do change pretty often. So we are constantly doing some outreach for, you know, the, the best practices as they are, um, as they come about. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And here, uh, this slide is listed some of the services that we provide uh, through the safety center. Um, as Dee had mentioned, we do a lot of planning, training, and exercise assistance. Actually, that's how I first uh, met Dee when she was uh, running the planning, training, and exercise emergency operation plan development training um, through the school safety center. And now the template that came out of that is available for folks to use as they're doing their own emergency operations planning, both on the individual school level and at the district and supervisory union level. Uh, we also put out planning guidance, the drill guidance, as we work with the fire safety uh, division to, to make sure um, you know, we're putting out information that is you know, safe in the time in which that guidance is issued. So with COVID, we had to go back and you can have large people gathering. We had to alter that guidance for egress drills and bus evacuation drills, which are required um, on a yearly basis. So some of those change based on the situation that we find ourselves in um, in the world. And the school safety center is the one that promotes that and pushes that information out. We also have information for parents and guardians um, for how they can respond in emergency situations. Um, and we give some templates there for our schools to communicate with uh, parents and guardians. Uh, we work on crisis communication and offer crisis communication classes uh, for schools uh, that may need to be issuing some of these communications in times of high stress uh, to help them, you know, figure out how to get that information out there. Uh, we also work uh, on the technical assistance side 
Um, there's 400 and, about 448 schools in Vermont, and a lot of them, um, especially in recent months, have been asking for individual audits and assessments of their physical security. Um, so what we would do is, as long as we have the capacity to do so, we will go out, and it takes about half a day to walk through a school uh, to measure, you know, measure and assess their infrastructure, their locking mechanisms, their public announcement system, their camera use, their lighting use on the outside of the buildings, things that, um, you know, are, are really important, uh, but I feel like there's always something that can be done in most schools. And so um, when we are able to, we are out in the field doing uh, those assessments and audits as well. But so like, Nick, I'd like to pause there for a moment while we're on the school construction topic. Mm -hmm. So we are, the state of Vermont is likely to make a big investment in school construction over the next several years, hopefully sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. When new buildings go up, when things happen, are you looking to require certain things, for example, uh, safer glass in case of a, a wind or a weather event or a, a gun, you know, or anything like, you know, or to, to sort of come through that region or the shopping, but anything like that being looked at or examined as new construction pops up, are we, does that make sense or? I would say that there's recommended measures. Um, okay. you know, there's like film that you can put over windows that is shatterproof for, you know. But I'm just, I guess like maybe that. it's but, more of a FYI. I think, I know this committee and I think the legislature in general is looking to improve our school buildings mm -hmm. and really start some new construction. Right. So I hate for us to then say after the building's up, not that anybody really would, but gosh, given some climate issues, we never put in these kinds of things. And I'm wondering if that's what we could look to all of you for, for some recommendations on that kind of, you know, again, as new buildings are going up, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And I think we would look to AOE to follow what some of their um, thoughts would be and, and some of their metrics that they would hope the you know, new constructions would meet. Um, okay. And I, I believe that they would also be including public safety in some of those conversations okay. just because they're a subject matter okay. experts in safety. Yeah. Uh, but right now there's not, a, as far as I know, I don't think there's any requirements being pushed out for new construction, but um, okay. it might be conversations that I'm not, you know, a part of at this point. Thank you. Um, I guess the last piece on this slide is just the emergency operation plan development. Uh, I know we give training exercises, um, I was just doing an options based response training for seven different schools down in the Bellows Falls area. We do uh, a number of trainings based on you know, the, the requests and our ability to get to those certain regions of the state, uh, but we are trying really hard to offer as many trainings and exercises as we, as we possibly can. And we can go to the next slide. This is just an overview of the school crisis planning team. You had asked if it was something that's newly formed. Um, it's, it's a team that's been around for quite a long time at this point. Um, basically, it's wonder, wonderfully devoted uh, representatives from a number of state agencies, uh, principals association, superintendents association. We have the chief of police, uh, the police association. We have represent, uh, representatives from uh, the Vermont State Police as well. We have 211 American Red Cross, um, mental health folks, school counselors. We all sit around a table, well, it's a virtual table at this point, once a month, and we talk about the things that are going on, current trends. We talk about what guidance we need to change, what trainings we'd like to bring. Uh, in the future, and it's a it, that's where the uh, recommendations that we put out for our standards and best practices and our operational guidance uh, that all comes with uh, after having gotten the approval from the school crisis planning team. And D is also on that team with us as well. Um, is there any questions about school crisis planning team? As the secretary, uh, Secretary French was here recently talking about this, and we were hearing about it uh, a little bit earlier. Uh, the Department of Public Safety has been working uh, closely, and myself, D, and Rob Evans uh, with AOE. We've been working with the Legislative uh, Council from AOE on drafting some of this language. Uh, we've presented it to the school crisis planning team and provided the feedback that they uh, gave to that draft language back to the Agency of Education. 
Um, we're excited to have some of these uh, focuses perhaps become, um, you know, mandated and, and inscribed in statute, uh, statute. So um, I, I, I'm very excited about what this, you know, what this could look like in the future. And those four, uh, four places that we mostly focused our energy on where it was the access control, the emergency operation plan development, the drills and the behavioral threat assessment. Uh, each of those have been things that the school uh, safety center has been working on for a number of years uh, with the school safety grant program with the governor um, for two years, two consecutive years, he uh, invested 4.1 and then $1.5 million in the infrastructure. A lot of that went to access control with um, notification systems, lighting, cameras, blocking mechanisms, um, the emergency operation plans. We've had, you know, Dee and her group um, giving trainings and exercises um, in, in association with emergency operations. We've been working on the drill pieces and that change in guidance in the face of the pandemic for a while. And now we have the current behavioral threat assessment program that's up and running. We've trained over 300 um, educators in the state. Uh, actually tomorrow and then following day, we have a train the trainer session, a two day session that we're trying to build up the capacity of folks that can go out and work with the individual teams and we have our first train the trainer session starting tomorrow. That's very exciting as well. So all of these areas that are now being, um, you know, drafted uh, with their language, these are all near and dear to our hearts. And we've had programs that are working towards this goal for a number of years. So um, it's very exciting that these things are being talked about now in this room. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we are very excited to have partnered with the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, they have a readiness and emergency management for schools program. We are bringing them up in April uh, to meet with Vermont educators to work on uh, the federal recommendations for emergency operations plans and developing those. Um, we are currently working to identify where we're going to hold that, but we have committed. Uh, we, we have made a commitment to provide that in April to our um, to our education stakeholders, and that's very exciting. We haven't had the U.S. Department of Education present or provide one of these trainings, I think, in about six or seven years. So we've had our state level ones. This is bringing in the federal government uh, to to provide some additional guidance, uh, which is very exciting. The next slide is the options-based response training. We spoke a little bit about this. Uh, Dee did a really good job of, uh, you know, covering what that really means. And uh, historically, the lockdown mode has been the mode to go to in the case of an emergency. You know, locks lights out of sight is sort of the the motto for that, where you lock the door, shut the lights off, and sort of hunker down. We're moving away from that uh, because. Sometimes that's not the best option and providing uh, educators and administrators with the idea that there's not just one universal um, response mechanism that empowers them to make other decisions that could save lives or prevent injury. Um, we have been <laughs> traveling around uh, through this uh, partnership with the state police and the school safety center. We traveled uh, throughout the state and provided 10 options-based response trainings with a partnership with the Vermont State Police. And we held those in schools throughout the state um, in the month of August. Uh, it also, you may have heard of ALICE training. ALICE training is another way, uh, another options-based response training, follows pretty much the same ideas of run, hide, fight, except run, hide, fight is sort of an easier to recall in the moment uh, approach to, to options-based response training, much like stop, drop, and roll is something you all can recall from probably kindergarten or first grade. So we have trained with options-based response training. I think we were at about 400 folks in attendance over the, the one month, and we've provided that same training at the Vermont Emergency Preparedness Conference, at the, uh, we spoke about it at the uh, Governor's School Safety Conference, and we've provided a couple of those to um, in uh, educators during the in-service day trainings uh, throughout the state as well. And we can move to the next slide. Thank you, you are doing a really great job. Uh, speaking about our behavioral threat assessment program, uh, we did mention you know, some pieces of this earlier. This was initiated through a Department of Justice award. Uh, we got over $350,000 and partnered with Sigma, now Sigma Ontic. 
um, and have been offering these trainings for the last year and a half. Um, our next train the trainer session it starts tomorrow and the next day. And we were also recently awarded an additional um, $250,000 through the Vermont Department of Homeland Security, uh, which will allow us to continue off, uh, offering these behavioral threat assessment trainings and additional train the trainer sessions um, in the future. So we just were awarded that about a month ago, and we're excited to be able to continue that um, because we do have the additional funding source, and that's a two-year grant. So we'll be offering those trainings um, and the train the trainer sessions for the next couple of years as well. And the last slide is just an overview of the current challenges that you folks will probably hear about as you, um, you know, talk about school safety. Um, these are things that are, are popping up on our monthly uh, calls with the school crisis planning team. Um, actually, in most of my conversations with any educator in whatever role they happen to be in, uh, these are the things that are popping up. The student behaviors coming out of pandemic, there's a rise, um, a, a severe, like a severe increase in um, outbursts of violence uh, with students, and they're seeing it in younger students too. Um, you know, you will find some of these behaviors that are very concerning in elementary school, where you typically in the past would not have seen this, and that could be part of the isolation from pandemic and the social, you know, the social uh, impacts from that, but we're seeing it across the spectrum, K through 12. Uh, there's a lot of behavior challenges right now, an incredible lack of mental health resources um, that could help assist with some of those behaviors. And when they go to seek assistance with um, local uh, agencies, they might not have anyone available for a number of months. And so that's, that's troubling as well. Um, I feel like Educators are so busy doing the things on their daily basis. Future planning um, is, is somewhat difficult. Uh, there's funding needs as always. And um, we, do, we do want to be encouraging in, in the future more emergency management and emergency planning collaboration with first responders. Um, as emergency operations plans are being developed, if you provide, you know, like a map of your school to your fire department and your police department that's only going to strengthen their ability to respond because you can say i'm in this you know i'm in this room uh, in this wing of a building and they'll have that map right there so having those collaborations and that rapport with first responders is really important and again the option space response initiative just giving uh folks in the education community the ability to have a number of options in order to address and respond and protect themselves. Those are those are the things that we've identified as really needing some some focus, um, and hopefully some of our programs and endeavors and initiatives will do that. Are you seeing an uptick in uh, threats against schools in Vermont right now? Or has it has it been? You know, can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and also just to, to elaborate from within the school or externally? Well, I I would say that I believe that they are on, on the increase. Um, we partner- You, you click that on that. Right, so the Vermont uh, Intelligence Center, they are the ones that oversee the anonymous tip line. Um, mm -hmm. They are the ones who receive uh, through either the portal, which is uh, able to be reported phone, text, you know, email, they, they do track that data. And I would say that um, with pretty good confidence that they'd probably say that they're seeing an increase in threats that are being reported or detected. Um, there's also a subcommittee that reviews after the information center receives the threatening information. They do a, an investigation on their own. If it's deemed credible, there's a subcommittee of school crisis planning team members um, and emergency management personnel that all will get together to figure out the best um, response and, and how to move forward with addressing the concern. I, I think that the data would, I'm, I'm positive, show that there's more uh, more threats happening. I know that I'm seeing a lot more of them come across you know, my email and my phone. And then if I were asked talking to parents this weekend during the legislative <laughs> breakfast, how would I, could I confidently say that this plan is going to make things safer and how compared to what's there now? Do you mean the, the, the plan? bill itself, the bill itself, in your opinion, is it just the coordination? Is it 
what's going to really make the school safer? What, a, a lot of anecdotally, a lot of some of the things that we've been hearing is um, that schools are looking for for guidance. There are a ton of resources, as, as yeah. um, Sunny had mentioned, through the Vermont School Safety Center, all fantastic um, information. But they were looking for more specific guidance, like um, you know what kind of training for manual threat assessment teams um, when, you know, what, what is visitor management? What should we be doing for visitor management? Um, what kinds of drills should we be doing? So I, I feel like this is the first step to providing them that guidance and those guardrails so they know where to, where to go. And, and again, touching on um, what Sunny mentioned earlier is, you know, our, we ask an awful lot of our schools and, um, you know, I, I would say that probably most teachers and educators didn't get into education because they wanted to develop emergency operations plans, yet mm -hmm. this is the world that we live in. So in trying to um, guide and give them all the supports that we have, build the capacity so that they're able to do that, build the capacity for the behavioral threat assessment teams, um, you know, with the understanding that it's providing training, the capacity and guidance for them to um, make the best decisions that, that they can. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the behavioral threat assessment team, I guess this is sort of piggy piggybacking on my initial question. I, I, I assumed it was sort of school-based because I can totally imagine in my mind if you've got a threat within the school, how you, how you would handle that. Where I can't quite... Um, what I don't understand is that there's a person in a community outside of the school that might be posing a threat. How does what does that look like? How do you like proactively identify and deal with that person? And I it's obviously I don't know a lot about law enforcement. So you may have, law enforcement might already have tactics or protocols around that. But can you speak a little bit to that? If there is a threat that like so a known potential threat outside of a building, how you handle that because i think that's in here right part of the work of the behavioral threat assessment team i see chief morrison's hand is up also i didn't know if you wanted to weigh okay. in on this or i didn't notice hating this but uh thank you uh i wanted to put some context on the numbers of threats and i have the luxury of being at my keyboard so i can pull some stuff up um so when we're talking about the number of school threats reported to the vic in all of 2022, we're talking about 26. And the number of, of tips that came in on the school tip line over the course of 2022 were four. So we're not talking about huge numbers. Um, in the first 20 days of 2023, there were three school threats reported to the VIC. So I guess if you take that and say that sounds like about one a week, that perhaps we could extrapolate that there would be 52, which would be double the 22 numbers. But I think it's too soon to say these things tend to go in um, fits and spurts, uh, depending on the school year calendar. Uh, so I just wanted to give a little bit of context that we're not talking about huge numbers to those. And um, to the question about how we handle threats that are, that are uh, generated by external actors who make a threat against a, a school facility, that is uh, another area of um, collaboration where when the information becomes known that we work uh, with the school to make them aware of the threat or challenge and so that they can do any target hardening or appropriate actions. Maybe that's a notice of trespass against the, uh, the person who's making the threat. But of course, law enforcement has a specific role to gather information and determine if it's a credible threat or not. And if it rises to the level of prosecution versus perhaps not to that level, and again, a notice a trespass is the only appropriate mechanism at that time. Um, but all threats to a school are reported through the Vermont Intelligence Center or are supposed to be, let me, let me leave that right there, uh, for the very purpose of being able to track them and, and provide the context that I just provided to you. Um, and then each th each threat or threatening situation is evaluated individually. Each one is is evaluated on the totality of the circumstances, on uh, how specific the threat was, on whether the person took any overt action towards carrying out said threat, um, 
and there's a lot that goes into that to determine if it's a threat that generates prosecution versus uh, other um, supports being provided. Similar to what Dee was mentioning about how a behavioral threat assessment is designed to identify behaviors and then provide interventions and supports to the person exhibiting those behaviors before criminal justice system involvement. It's not all that dissimilar from if the, the threatening actor is outside the school environment that we would seek to try and provide supports through mental health workers um, or other methods uh, to bring that person to a place where they are no longer threatening a school environment um, in that way. Does that answer your question or both of your questions? Thank you, yes. Chief Morrison, if we were to, as a committee, uh, have somebody in that could talk to us about other things that are being done, and I also recognize that the Vice Chair of Judiciary Center, Hashim, is on this committee, but to give everyone an understanding of what's happening outside of the school day, whether it's the red flag law or other kinds of pieces of legislation that intersects with this kind of work. Um, maybe you could give some thought to that. I could certainly talk to Senator Hashim and Senator Sears, just so everybody understands what else is happening out there. And I do suspect once we finish with this bill, we'll probably go down to judiciary, at least for a look at some point. Yeah, that sounds good. I'd be happy to collaborate with you in, in any way that is useful, useful to you and in order uh, to contextualize the, the bigger environmental picture, because of course, Schools are not silos alone in our communities, right, right? right? And if there's violence and outbursts, as D or Sonny or one of them was talking about, um, the frequency and severity of outbursts and behavioral uh, violent behaviors that are being exhibited as low as our elementary schools, if that is happening there, then there are clearly intersections with what is happening in the home, what is happening in the broader community, where do we need to bring supports in to intervene and interrupt these cycles before they become uh, involved with the criminal justice system. And so we make hopefully them a healthier, happier person or family and prevent people from being involved in the criminal justice system or harming others. Yeah, it just as an example, several of us had meetings with our hospitals this week uh, over violence that was being seen in the emergency rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the governor put some money in the budget to help deal with that. Uh, just another sort of group out there, nurses, physicians, others having to deal with uh, increased violence. Senator Williams. Just a, I'd like to encourage you to include uh, somebody from the municipality in your response team. Mm -hmm. I, I had an example of a town in, uh, in our district where they had a lockdown of the school and there was some drug activity next door. And the phone started ringing off the wall telling us, and they, they didn't know anything about what was going on and they, they couldn't field the call. So how do you deal with uh, the media and communications? Is that all part of the training for the assessment team? So that would be part of the emergency operations plan, the all hazards emergency operations plan. Okay. And there are different sections on how to, to deal with a variety of hazards. You know, it could be um, you know a chemical leak in the chemistry lab. It could be electric, uh, no electricity, mm -hmm. or a school bus goes off the road. So that would be part of, and you know, could be an appendix to the emergency operations plan. Um, and again, it's all hazards, so that would fall within. Um, and and as um, we mentioned earlier, the the um, approach we're, we're looking for in it as it's uh, the language is, is written now is to involve um, local emergency management as part of looking at that plan and being a part of that plan because just as you mentioned that that is really important in, in a lot of um, mutual responses to to various hazards. So we are going to hear from our educational partners this week. They'll testify on this. Uh, we'll also hear from, uh, there's a national organization out there that looks at education issues. I'm gonna ask them just to say, tell us a little bit of what's happening in other states. Are, do, are we pushing things you know, far enough ahead or are there other states that are maybe doing more? And that could be something you all also weigh in on it. And 
yeah, we'll continue to work on it. I suspect we'll get something out you know, sometime in February. Good time for one more. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Uh, so I applaud what you're doing. A phenomenal, uh, phenomenal activity. A uh, question on the emergency um, uh, operations plan, just because I'm kind of new into this, this arena. Uh, I understand when a school has a, a situation where the, um, the issue is uh, inside the school or it's a, or it's a threat to the school. But what about um, to the chairman's point a uh, half hour ago or so about uh, natural disasters in the area where the school becomes more of a focal point uh, for response as opposed to you know uh, uh, experiencing a threat in, inside? And I just again just curious if the emergency operations plan considers how the school is utilized in a you know in a community-wide um, uh, scenario in the sense that um that the school will be used as maybe a warming shelter or exactly. or something like exactly. that okay um that can definitely um be worked into the plan and again the, the template of the plan allows for flexibility okay. because in some communities that may be the designated you know warming shelter or or right. other it may be used for other purposes in an emergency. So in those cases where um, towns do utilize those schools for, for those purposes, it should be part of that emergency. So, so it is part of the template or it should, be part, it should be part of the town plan. Right, uh, the right. The emergency, the regional emergency management plans, those those okay. already exist. So right. yeah. thank you. There's probably a memorandum of understanding between the school and the community yeah, uh, that would establish it for an alternative shelter or something along those lines, whatever it needs to be. Okay, thank you. That's where the importance between the emergency, the like local emergency management director and the school, that relationship is really important. Thank many thanks to all three of you. Really appreciate it. I think we're off to a good start. Thank you for having yeah, us. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, let's just take five Thank you. Minutes. Have a good day.